about us today? Yes. Tell Mr. Romero we love him, will ya? Yeah, I'm roasted. Tony, stop that. <laughs> That's because your wife is at home. How's she doing? I know she got back from Denver yesterday. Okay, today's going to be a really different day. Uh, I'm going to give you the title. I never do this. I'm going to give you the title of this sermon. And then we're not going to look at any scripture for a long time. Uh, well, that may be not true. We may be looking at 1 John 4 first. But, um, and then we'll just kind of read through that. But the title of the sermon is this. I, I really want you to realize what is happening here. God is inviting you. So I want you to think of God extending an invitation to you personally. And he's inviting you into a life that requires um, infin inf infinitely more, excuse me, I can't even read my own writing, infinitely more than you have to give. Now, I'm going to say that again. He's, he's offering you a chance to live a life that's so transformed that it requires from you more, infinitely more, than you are able to give. D does that make sense to you? He wants you to get, be in a life, and he's, he's, he's really commanding Christians to do this. He wants you to become the person that is the best person that, that you can be, but the best person you can be is so far greater than you're capable of being that he's inviting you into something that's completely impossible, and yet he's commanding you to do it, but he's giving you that invitation. And to me, this is a great challenge. I, I don't know how else to say it, but you'll get it as we go through this. It's like this. It's like, as a believer in Christ, I want you to hear this. As a believer in Christ, the best person in the world that doesn't know Christ is here, and you as a Christian should be here. Did you hear that? As a believer in Christ, the best person who doesn't have Christ in the world, Mahatma Gandhi, I mean, choose somebody. Choose somebody that doesn't have Christ, that's here. You as a believer are supposed to be here. Oftentimes we compare ourselves to those people around us who are less than, but Jesus says, I want you to take the person in the world, the natural person in the world, who is the greatest of all time, who is the most wonderful person you can imagine without Christ, and you're to be I'm inviting you into a life that's above that, that's beyond that. God says it this way in his word, be ye perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. God isn't requiring the world to perfection. God is requiring us into perfection. And so we have to know what that means and we have to know how to ferret it out and we have to know how to bring it all together. Last week we talked about this conversation of what the three societies were like, the Roman government and the Jewish government and the Greek government, and how all three of those governments really mistreated women, especially the Greeks, and how they, how they just really, really mistreated women and saw them as things or as possessions instead of as equal human beings, and how Jesus came and flipped that on its head, and how Jesus is requiring, again, Jesus is requiring the Christian in the Sermon on the Mount, he's requiring the Christian to be above the greatest natural person that you can know or that's ever lived in history. Now that's amazing if you think about it. And so we're going to talk about that. So we have all of these people who don't treat people well and we find that Jesus wants you to treat people well. But the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount is how you do that. It all, it's like you're whittling, anybody ever whittle a, a, a stick with a, a point on it and then you used to throw it as a spear? I used to do that as a kid all the time. My, I would go with my dad down to the river and we would get these willows, these red willows, and we would make bows and arrows and we'd sharpen the arrows and we'd shoot the bows and arrows. I mean, I remember that as, a, a, as one of the highlights of my life when I was a little boy. 
like we whittle that down to a sharp point. Well, what's the point that God is getting to through Jesus and through the writer of Matthew and in Luke, if you want to look at the same conversation in Luke? What's the point? What's it being whittled down to? What's the one thing that matters? And there's one thing that God says. And that one thing is the thing that we're going to look at today. But, and it's the, it's the idea of valuation. It's the idea of what you value. And, and in business, if you look at the word valuation, it means this. Valuation is the process of determining the worth of an asset or a company. Evaluation is important because it provides prospective buyers with an idea how much they should pay for an asset or company and prospective sellers of how much they should, they should sell it for. So an evaluation tells you what it's worth. And God is saying through Jesus, through his son, and he's saying through the writer of Matthew who wrote the book of Matthew, he is saying, I want you to evaluate everything through this. And I want you to evaluate mostly your life through this. This is what, this is what I want you to put up. And every person who is a believer in Christ and every person who was born has a valuation except yours as a believer is higher than the one that, that you're not worth more, but your valuation is more because you have a process to fulfill and your process is greater than the person that doesn't know Christ. Does that make sense? We should be so far above what natural man is. And I'm not asking you to compare yourself to Antifa. <laughs> it's kind of a joke. You should laugh. I'm not asking you to compare yourself to the people that set up Chaz in Seattle. I'm not asking you to compare yourself to the people that are making themselves at home on college campuses and are shouting anti-Jewish sentiments. I'm not asking you to compare yourself to them. I'm asking you to look at the greatest human being that you know that's not a believer, and your valuation is higher than that. So that might scare you. That might challenge you. That might put you in a different place. That might make you run away from Christianity. But what it should do is it should put a, sp a spark in your spirit and you should begin to ask some questions like, what does that mean? And how do I do that? And how do I get there? And you know, where does all this come from? And how do you know that's true that I'm supposed to be a step above? How do, how do you know all of that? Well, we're going to find that out. The first, the first scripture, I, I, I kind of lied to you. I didn't mean to, but we're not going to get into Matthew. I should say that for a while. Let's go to 1 John 4. 7, 1 John 4, 7, and it says this, Beloved, or in mine it says, Dear friends, let us love one another. That word love is the word agape. We've talked about what that means, and we'll talk about it a little more in a minute. But it says, Let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves and has been born of God and knows God. So, see, that's the Christian, Right? That's whoever love, uh, uh, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So the inference here is that those of us who are not privileged to know God and haven't said yes to him yet, those of us who live there, those of us don't really understand this kind of love, and therefore you can't be above the Christian. The natural man is here, and the Christian is here, especially when it comes to to love. Now watch how important love is. Watch this. Anyone who does not love does not know God. So if you don't love, if you don't know God, you don't love, and if you don't love, you don't know God. And so this concept of love is really important. Watch this. Because God is love. 1 John 4, 8b. One of the first scriptures I ever memorized. God is love. It was easy to memorize it. You probably already have it memorized right now. God is love. 1 John 4, 8b. God is love. 1 John 4, 8b. God is love. And because God is love, because that's who he is, that's his attribute, and his attribute is also holy, he is a holy love, a love of purity, and a love that, that is agape love, a love that is selfless, a love that gave his only begotten son, for God so loved the world, same word agape, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It's not the word filio, it's not brotherly love, it's not the same kind of love that I, that I have for Billy, my brother, or for Harry, my brother. And not, not when, I, when I have an emotion towards them. In fact, this love can be void of emotion. This love, this agape love, is a love that doesn't, sometimes doesn't have emotion in it. 
It's a love that chooses somebody else's best interest all the time, no matter who they are or what they are. Now, did you catch that? When my children or when your children or somebody's encamping on a college or somebody's screaming anti-Jewish rhetoric or some of those kinds of things or somebody's putting you down or using hand signals as you drive by them and you don't know why or whatever, this kind of love doesn't get emotionally involved. This kind of love is beyond that. And no matter what other people do, this kind of love wants the best for that person, no matter what or who they are. That's why I can say of the people who molested me when I was a little boy, you know, that really, that really is an interesting thing because sometimes people get molested and I'm not, I'm, just, I'm not just talking about once in my life. I'm talking about I was molested. Sometimes people who get molested can never forgive and never forget, never let those people off the hook, and they live with a, a bitterness inside of their spirit that never goes away. And so that's not this love. This love is saying, God, forgive them. This love is the love of Jesus hanging on the cross and saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. This is the love that goes beyond an insult, it goes beyond a molestation, goes beyond a negative that you can think is the most negative on the planet. This love goes beyond that negative, and you still, if you're the one that was offended, you still want the best for the person that offended you. That's this love. So, verse 8 again. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he had loved us and sent his son to be our propitiation, our remedy, our forgiveness, our solution, our propitiation for our sins. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God if we love one another. God abides in us and his love is perfected. You see, a natural person says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You see, a natural person says, it's my right to get what I get from these people because these people have offended me in such and such a way. But you see, that's the natural man. That's the goodness in the natural man. The goodness in the believer of God is so far beyond that. And the goodness in the believer of God says, God, forgive them. I want what's best for them in all situations. That's amazing. That's a life that's to be lived continually as a believer in Christ. That's amazing. So let's go on beyond. There's a lot left in there. You could re take that home and read it. And go down to verse 22, all the way down to 22 and read it. But I, we don't have any more time for that. Dear friends, since God loved us so much, we surely ought to love others, it says. <coughs> Excuse me. It is clear, when we go back and read Matthew 5, and we will in a minute, it is clear that to love your enemies, because that's what Jesus tells us to do, to love your enemies, whether they are lovable or not, requires a self-denial. It's clear that it requires a self-denial. In other words, agape is a selfless love that thinks of others before it thinks of itself. It follows the only way one can truly love. This is the only really way that love exists. There's an eros love, that's a, a, a sensual love that men have for women and women have for men. And, you know, you get married and you, you fall in love and, you know, you, you go crazy and you, you see this person and you, you, when you see her, somebody hits you in the head with a frying pan and you go, ah, and you're all giddy and all that. 
Christ. That's one kind of love. <clears throat> That's an heiress love. That's not mentioned in the Bible, by the way. Did you know that? And there's a filial love, which is a brotherly love, and there is this love, and there's another one too, but just this is an agape love. This is written, and so is in Matthew 5, this is written in the present imperative. Jesus commands us, and when anything's ever written in an imperative, it's a command. Jesus is commanding us. See, this isn't God's suggestion. This isn't a holy suggestion for the believer in Christ. This is God's suggestion. This is rather than a suggestion. This is a command. It's a supernatural love as a lifestyle. It's a supernatural love as a continual practice. It's a love that goes beyond anything that we're able to do on our own. You can't do this on your own. You can only do this through the love of Christ in your life. And you can only do this when you are conscious of doing it. Because you will often forget not to love this way. Because when somebody hurts you, what do you want to do? I want to slap him back right? And I make, it, I make it palatable because I want to say, I'm going to knock you out in Christian love. You add in Christian love to that, so you're okay. That's not okay. Clearly, this command can only be obeyed by the grace that God gives us through faith in the fact that the Spirit of Christ indwells us and will manifest this love through us. It is impossible, but it is Him possible. That's what you have to realize. This is a him possible love. And it's the kind of love that he commands you to have. Corey Timboom once said, and we're going to read an excerpt of Corey Timboom in a minute, but Corey Timboom once said this. She knew what this kind of agape love was because she was in a concentration camp. You see, Corey Timboom's family, oh, well, I won't tell you the story. We'll come back to that in a minute. But this is what she said. You quote, you never so touch the ocean of God's love as when you forgive and love your enemy. You can't even touch the love of God until you practice the love of God. You can't do, you see, I think this is the most interesting concept. I can't understand this until I am willing to reach out my hand and do this. And if you look at all of the, 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 the Sermon on the Mount so far that we've talked about, you know, if somebody slaps you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. If somebody takes your coat, give them your, if we ask you to go a mile, go two miles. And, and do not be divorced. Why? Because what God has put together, let not man cut asunder. What that means is this. I so love my spouse, even in the most difficult times when we hate each other. You see, love and hate are the two sides of the same coin, boys and girls. You can emotionally love and you can emotionally hate in the same breath. Amen. And when you go through the whole Sermon on the Mount, it's be responding, it's us being able to respond to those difficult situations in life with the love, agape love of God that no natural human being has. It's beyond you. It's him possible, not you possible. It's God that is in you, but you won't experience the ocean of the agape love of God. You won't experience all the love that God has until you're ready to reach out and embrace your enemy. Isn't that amazing? Not yell at your enemy. Not scream at them, not tolerate them, but love them. Wow. Why we should love our enemies? Well, the thing is, is that it reveals to us and to God what God's mercy really is. When I love somebody else, then they see God's mercy. If I don't love my enemy, especially if they're a non-Christian, they won't see the mercy of God. They only see the mercy of God when the love of God is exposed to them. He, God, makes his sunrise. It says that in Matthew 5, 
45, where we're going to go to in a minute. He makes the sun rise on the evil and the good, right? And he makes the rain rain on the just and the unjust. See, that's what God's love is. No matter how unjust or how difficult your life is or how bad you are or no matter what you've done, God lets his sun rise and sun set on you and God lets the rain uh, come on you. You see, it used to be thought that the rain wouldn't come on your land if you didn't please God. That's what used to, it was a quid pro quo, as Billy likes to say. But that's not how God works. God loves everyone, for God so loved the world. It doesn't say God so loved those who chose him or the ones he chose, and they said yes. It said God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. This, this thing goes to everybody, and it goes to everybody through us. And they won't see the mercy of God if you and I don't extend our hand in that kind of love. That's what it means to be. Be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Extend the hand of love to your enemy. And not just extend the hand of love to your enemy, but it says go beyond that and pray for them. Wow. He does not deal with us according to our sins. He does not repay us according to our iniquities, it says in Psalms 103.10. Think about that for yourself. He does not repay us according to our iniquities. He doesn't look at me and say, Rick, you really are a dirt ball. And I'm telling you, you are no good. And because you're no good, I'm going to take every one of your sins and I'm going to make you pay for it. No, he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on a cross and his son paid for it for me. And now that mercy is supposed to be extended to those who mistreat me like they mistreated Christ. That's why there should be no divorce. Remember, the natural man is here. The natural man will be divorced all day long, but the Christian man is here. You are required to do something far above normal human kind. The Bible says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God Christ forgave you in Ephesians 4 3. Now think about that. I'm supposed to be tender hearted. I'm supposed to forgive one another as Christ forgave me. And look at the, we're going to see it in a little bit because it's in the Sermon on the Mount, right? The, the prayer that, that they prayed. What is it? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does that mean? Let your love be through me the way it is in heaven. Let me be the perfect perfect example of your love on this earth. J.C. Riley, I wanted to read this to you because it was really good. A standard of conduct like this may seem at first sight extravagantly high. Who can do it? Are any of you asking that question? Well, that sounds great, Pastor Rick, if that's what I'm supposed to be, but I don't get it. How am I supposed to be that? But, he goes on to say, we must never content ourselves with aiming at one lower. We must never content ourselves with aiming at a love that's lower than the one we're describing. We must observe the two weighty arguments by which our Lord backs up this part of his instruction. They deserve serious attention. For one thing, if we do not aim at the spirit and temper which are here recommended or commanded, we are not yet children of God. So if we refuse to aim at this, we can't call ourselves believers in Christ. We, uh, what does our Father in heaven do? He is kind to all. He sends rain on good and evil alike. He causes his son to shine on all without distinction. A child should be like his father, but where is our likeness to our father in heaven if we cannot show mercy and kindness to everybody? Where is the evidence we are new creatures if we lack charity? How can I say that I'm a new creature if I lack charity? It is altogether wanting. We must yet be born again. For another thing, if we do not aim at the spirit and temper here recommended or, co or commanded, we are manifestly yet of the world. So you see what Riley is saying? I love this. 
He says, we really can't call ourselves Christians if we don't aim at this kind of love with our life. And we really can't <laughs> say that we belong to God. And we really have to recognize that we belong to the Lord. Wow, what a statement. You're not supposed to just love them. You're supposed to pray for them. And this word pray is really interesting. It has a, um, it starts out with pros. Pros is, in the Greek is, means toward something, to something. And the second part of this word means to wish upon or pray for. So this describes, now listen to this, when you're supposed to pray for your enemies, this describes prayer directed consciously towards God with a definite aim. And the aim isn't, Lord, get him. Because <laughs> sometimes we feel that way, right? When my kids mess up with other kids, I don't blame my kids, I blame the other stupid kids. Anybody in here do that? Because <laughs> my kids can't be like that. <laughs> Oh, God, I want you to just tear those kids apart for helping my kids do it. No, 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 no. That's not God's love. God's love is, Lord, please forgive them. I don't want any of those kids to spend eternity without you. I pray that you would save every soul. I pray that your family would be greater by the addition of these. Please, Father, move in their lives. I pray for them. I pray for them. My prayer is directed to God for their salvation. I have an aim when I pray. Hmm. Jesus has set the bar extremely high, folks. Can't get any higher. If the torture of crucifixion did not prevent our Lord from praying for his enemies, what insult, what injury, what enmity, what pain, what cruel word from our persecutors might silence our prayers? Did, did, does that make sense? I'm pretty convicted by this conversation. I don't know about you. How quick my reaction is to get even when somebody does something again me, again me. <laughs> oh, Lord, get him. But I need to pray like Stephen. You see, it says in Acts seven sixty, it says this: falling on his knees, he was being bombarded and stoned to death for his faith. He cried out with a loud voice, and this is what he said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And then he died. Look, God never lowers his standard, folks. God doesn't say, oh, well, you poor people, you can't make it, so here's the standard to love in agape love, but guess what? I, you can just love down here. You, don't, you, you can be like all the rest of the people in the world. You don't really have to love. No, God never, ever lowers his standard. He brings you up to a place to meet him. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones speaks of this call to the distinction. He says, you are distinct, explaining that, quote, the Christian is the man who is above and goes beyond the natural man at his very best and his very highest. There are many people in the world who are not Christians, but who are very moral and have a great high ethic. Men whose word is their bond and who are scrupulous and honest, just and right. You never find them doing a shady thing to anybody, but they are not Christian and they would tell you so. They do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and may have rejected the whole of the New Testament teaching and scorn it. But they are absolutely straightforward, honest, and true. 
Now the Christian by nef- definition here is a man who is capable of doing something that the best natural man cannot do. He goes beyond and does more than that. He exceeds. He is separate from all others and not only from the worst among them, but from the very best and the very highest among them. Man, I'm really convicted by this. Let me read you a story. Got to find it first. The year was 1944. Nazi Germany occupied Holland. An elderly watchmaker and his family are actively involved in the Dutch underground. They were hiding Jewish people in the secret room of their home. Members of the Ten Boom family courageously helped Jewish men and women and children escaping Hitler's roll call to death. Now, folks, we have something completely opposite happening today in our society, which makes me sick. Listen to this. Yet one fateful day, their secret is discovered. The watchmaker is arrested and soon after being in prison, he dies. His tender-hearted daughter, uh, Betsy, also cannot escape the jaws of death at the hands of her cruel captors. In the Nazi concentration camps, she perishes. And what about Corey, the watchmaker's youngest daughter? Will she live? And if so, will she ever be able to forgive her captors, those who caused the death of her father and her sister, while she is trying to survive the ravages of uh, Ravensbrück, one of Hitler's most horrific death camps? Can anything sustain Corey Ten Boom? To what can she cling? Indeed, Corey does survive. Her God sustains her. She lives the truth of these words. Quote, false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Psalm 27. Two years. After the war, Corey is speaking at a church in Munich. She went back to Germany. She has come from Holland to a defeated Germany, bringing with her the message that God does indeed forgive. There in the crowd, a solemn-faced, stark man stared back at her. As the people file out, a balding, heavy-set man moves towards her. A man in a gray overcoat, a man clutching a brown felt hat. Suddenly, a horrible feeling flashes back in her mind, a memory about a blue uniform. The visor cap with its skull and crossbones. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights. The humiliation of walking naked past this man. This man who is now standing before her. Quote, you mentioned Ravensbrück in your talk. I was a guard there, he said. But since the time I have come, since that time, excuse me, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. He extended his hand toward her and asked, will you forgive me? Corey stares at the outstretched hands. The moment seems like hours as she wrestles with the most difficult decision she has ever had to make. Corey knows scripture well, but applying the passage seems to be too difficult for her, too much. She remembers, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he, for, if he repents, forgive him. Hmm. 
do this now with urgency, Corey. She did. Forgive him if his sins against you, if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you and says, I repent, forgive. Forgive him. Standing here is the enemy. The former SS officer, his very presence stands for cruelty and the stench of crematoriums at Ravensbrook. As Corey Timboom stares at the rough hand offered by her former captor, she knows in her head what she has to do, forgive. But her emotions scream silently in opposition. The very message she has been sharing with the victims of Nazi, of Nazi brutality emphasized that she must forgive those who persecuted her. Forgiveness is a necessity, but Corey stands paralyzed as the battle rages in her mind and in her emotions. Quote, I stood there. I, whose sins had been again and again forgiven and could not forgive. Really, my sister Betsy had died in that place. Could it be that easy just to say you're forgiven with no retribution? Imagine Corey's dilemma. She knows that the, those who have forgiven their enemies have been able to rebuild their lives regardless of the physical horrors they suffered but those who continue to nurse their bitterness remain imprisoned. Not in Hitler's horrid cremation camps, but within their own wounded souls. Corey knows the cost of bitterness and the very bitterness she is battling because it, the Bible says, quote, see to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause terrible or cause trouble, excuse me, and defile many. Corey Timboom learned that she not only needed to be forgiven by God, but also that she needed to forgive as God forgave. She needed to show mercy, for Jesus said, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, kindness, or goodness, and goodwill toward the miserable and the afflicted, joined with a desire to relieve them. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but I've come to call the sinner. The horrors of World War II are now far behind Corey Tim Boom, but the horrors of the war between forgiveness and unforgiveness still rage in her mind. How can she find the strength to take the hand of someone who represented the evil regime that destroyed the two people she held most dear? How can she forgive this man? To Corey's dismay, she discovers she cannot. Now all of this is going through her head as this man has his hand stretched out toward her. His hand was thrust out to shake mine. And I, who had preached so often the need to forgive, kept my hand by my side. Even as the angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin of them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile. I struggled to raise my hand. I could not. I felt nothing, not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And so again, I breathed the silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness as I took his hand. The most incredible thing happened. From my shoulder, along my arm and 
through my hand. A current seemed to pass from me to him while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not on your own forgiveness, more, and it's not on your own goodness, that the world's healing hinges, but it hinges on Christ's forgiveness and Christ's goodness through me. When he tells us to love our enemies, he gives us along with the command, the love itself. <laughs> Would you put up Matthew 5.43? You have heard that I was said, this is the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to, to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Now I want to stop right there for one second. Sons of your Father who is in heaven. Hebrew doesn't have really many adjectives, descriptive words. And if in Hebrew someone would say, he is the son of peace, which would mean he's a peaceful man. Does that make sense? So I want you to take that conversation about son of peace, and I want you to read this again. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. What does that mean? That you may be, you may be a person who is like the Father in heaven. If you're a son of the Father, you are like the Father. How are you like the Father? In the way that you extend a love that's beyond human possibility. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Now watch this. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore, you therefore, you therefore must be perfect even as your heaven. it mean to be perfect? Well, this is another part of the teaching, but I don't want to take away from what we just heard because I think it's really impactful. It is to me anyway. But so what does it mean to be perfect? Suppose, let me give you a, an illustration. This comes from Ch uh, William Barclay. Suppose in my house there was a screw loose and I want to tighten and adjust that screw. I go out to the ironmonger, or I'd go to the Home Depot, but whatever, and buy a screwdriver. I find that the screwdriver exactly fits the gap of my hand, the grip of my hand. It is neither too large or too small, not too tough or too smooth. I lay the screwdriver on the slot of the screw and I find that it exactly fits. I then turn the screw and the screw is fixed. In the Greek sense, and especially in the New Testament sense, the screwdriver is perfect because 
it does exactly what it's supposed to do. It fulfills the purpose for which it was designed. That's perfect. Fulfill the purpose for which you're designed. Everything up until now in the Sermon on the Mount is whittled down to this. Fulfill the purpose for which you're designed. And you're designed to be something greater than natural man. You're designed not to live on this plane, but to live on this one. And you're designed to live on this plane to fulfill what you were perfected to fulfill. You're designed on this plane to love the way that God loves so that people can see the mercy of God and choose God. You're designed not to hate your enemies, but to love them and to pray for them. You're designed to let those who want to borrow, borrow. You're designed to let those who want to slap you on the cheek, you're supposed to turn the other cheek and let them slap you again. Why are you designed for all that? Because you're designed to live this love, the standard which is way up here. Does that make sense? How many are challenged by this? Thank you, Father, for today. When I sing, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul sings it. Father, when I sing that, may your love be my highest goal. May your love be my greatest aim. May the perfection of your love be within me that I don't even desire the unforbidden things and that I value all those you have created. In Jesus' precious name we pray. waiting for me to do something, I'm done. <laughs>